morning. And welcome to this Sunday service where we get to see the mercies of God and what that mercy of God does leads us to conform to his word. Before we begin our service, though, we're going to hear a, a little information from our principal, Principal Yeager, and this is in our church's desire to, to keep you, the members, as informed as to everything that's going on because there are some just tremendous blessings. That's 
some people to step up as leaders for people. You um, can't expect the faculty and administration to do those things. We really need volunteers to, to help do those things. So if you can encourage someone or if you're willing to serve in that way, uh, please let me know because we're, we, we want to keep people going and doing the things that we're doing. Um, finally, who wants to do my work? If you want to find a way to give us the old one, you'd be happy to have it. Um, for, for the short one, I guess we should say the short one, we just use another one in the kitchen. So if you got one sitting around that you're not using, We'll take the old one. I think that's all I have. But just remember, as you sing that final hymn today, think about the school. God has blessed us tremendously um, with our staff, with all the people who have worked hard to refurbish the rooms and even set up the way they're set up, uh, the people who have helped maintain the building. Um, we've got plenty to give thanks to God for it. We'll begin with the opening hymn, 771. As we'll continue with the responsive reading. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. We confess our sins then to God. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll join in praying. Bountiful Lord God, 
Your presence fills our hearts with joy, and your blessing nourishes our souls with peace. Enlighten us by your Holy Spirit, that we may see and appreciate these gifts as tokens of your amazing love, to your glory and praise. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, that prophet, in a moment of weakness, questions and doubts the Lord. And the Lord responds to him. He says, turn back to me and I will be your strength. So when life has you down with, has you overcome with fear and grief, turn not to men, but turn to the Lord for your strength. Jeremiah says this, O Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Take vengeance for me on those who persecute me. You are slow to anger. Do not take me away. Keep in mind that for your sake I bear disgrace. Your words came to me and I devoured them. Your words became my joy, the delight of my heart, because I bear your name, O Lord of armies. I did not sit with the band of party goers, nor did I celebrate with them. I sat alone because your hand was upon me. You filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending? Why is my wound incurable? Refusing to heal. Will you be as, a, as deceptive as an intermittent stream to me, like a source of water that a person can't depend on? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will take you back so that you may stand before me. If what you say is worthwhile and not worthless, you will be my spokesman. They, those Israelites, they must, not, they must turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you like a bronze wall to this people. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, because I am with you to save you and to rescue you, declares the Lord. I will rescue you from the hand of the wicked, and I will deliver you from the grasp of the ruthless. That is God's word. Our second reading is from Romans 12. With the mercy of the Lord being your inspiration, live your whole life conforming to that will of God. Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. Also do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. So by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think in a way that results in sound judgment, as God distributed a measure of faith to each of you, for we have many members in one body, and not all the members have the same function. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. If the gift is prophecy, do it in complete agreement with the faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then encourage. If it is contributing, be generous. If it is leadership, be diligent. If it is showing mercy, do it cheerfully. That is God's word. We'll continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to please stand for the gospel. For Matthew 16, especially in those last three verses, Jesus instructs us, don't trade the blessings of Jesus 
for the blessings of this world. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, May you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. After all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? That is the word of our Savior. God's word from Romans 12, the first two verses. Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. Also, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that you test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. You know what the definition of mercy is? Simply put, mercy is being shown that which you don't deserve. That wasn't very simple. It's, it's compassion. It's not treating you as you deserve. And so when the Lord starts these verses off, therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, what the Lord is doing is, is getting the readers that Paul was writing to and getting the readers, us, today to remember and reflect on is that awesome mercy that God has shown to you. You can see it in two ways. First, first the physical, the material stuff that we got. None of us can say... We deserve the spouse. We deserve the family we have. Because we can think of a long laundry list of reasons why our spouse should leave us, why our children should hate us, because we've stumbled and screwed up. But in mercy, we have a family. In mercy, we have a job. In mercy, think of all the luxuries that God has given to you, running water, a home or two or three, how many cars, how many acres of land, how many different pairs of clothing do you have? Just think of the absolute mercy that you have. And you know why you don't deserve to have a beautiful home or multiple cars or acres of land. Flows into the second reason, way that God shows mercy. It's because we're sinners. We don't deserve to have any good thing in our life, yet Lord, the Lord still blesses us with wonderful things. We see God's mercy in our lives as he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't damn us straight to hell, but he said, here's my son Jesus. He's going to take your sins upon himself. He's going to suffer and die in your place. He's going to win you heaven. We see the awesome mercy both right in front of our face in that we receive through faith in Jesus, that awesome mercy of getting what we don't deserve from God. And what does he say in these verses? In view of my mercy, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world. Because of God and what he has done, you are to be a nonconformist. 
You aren't to go along with what this sinful world says you should think, says you should believe, says you should do. You are to not conform. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to be different? Are you ready to fight the good fight of faith? Are you ready to call sin a sin? The examples I'm going to use are going to be some of the most obvious ones, but the point will be proven, Lord willing, at the, the tail end of this. There's an election coming up, and if you notice that there is an election, you start to see uh, you know, support for candidate A or candidate B, whether it's a sign or a flag or a bumper sticker? Are you, in view of the mercy God has shown you, are you willing to make it clear as day that you're going to follow that will of God, that you are going to put on the back of your car or put in your yard Abortion is a sin. Abortion is murder. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to place, paste all over your Facebook, Instagram, and whatever other stuff there is that the act of homosexuality, transgenderism, is a sin? Are you ready, as clear as day, to say that violence, whether it is physical or verbal, is wrong? Are you ready to say, in line with Romans 13, as our Lord of heaven and earth teaches us, that rebellion against governmental authorities is rebellion against God himself? And they said, Are you ready to put it out there for the whole world to see that you are teaching your children in line with the truth of Scripture, that your children, your family is going to follow that singular truth, the only truth that has eternal and lasting effects? And you will not apologize for it either. Now again, these examples I used are some of the most out there in your face, non-conforming to the way this world says you can and should live. So what are you going to do? Will you conform to the pattern of this world? Because you know what happens if you don't conform? You know what happens if you don't go along with what this sinful world says? You know what's going to happen? There's going to be some friction because you're going against the grain. And when there's friction, there's a little suffering. There's a little pain. You know who was a nonconformist? Daniel. Do you know who else was not, were nonconformists? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't go along with the sinful decrees that those kings made. Pray to this statue, pray only to this king, or you're going to die. They went against the grain of that society. They didn't conform with those sinful decrees. And what happened? Lion's den. What happened? Fiery furnace. Praise the Lord that God protected them. But when you don't conform to the pattern of this sinful world, real problems can come to your life. Those are just two examples. And so what are you going to do? Will you just conform so that you don't have to sit here and worry about a lion's den or a fiery furnace or sit here and worry about being attacked for what you believe to be true? Will you turn a blind eye to your fellow human being as they're drowning in their sins and say, well, that's too bad. I'm just going to be quiet because I don't want people to know. Or will you conform 
Because in your mind, you're able to justify and rationalize whatever it is and conform. You conform. You conform to the pattern of this sinful world. You know what you're doing. You're taking that mercy that God has shown you, and in place of mercy, God's going to say, huh, okay, here's some wrath. Here's some fire. Here's eternity in hell because you made a choice. You made a choice to conform to this world. You made a choice. If you were to read that, that gospel lesson from Matthew 16, you chose the blessings, you chose acceptance in this world over me. You reap what you sow. Nice choice. Get ready to suffer. That's what the Lord said. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. Also, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. The mercies of God. Not receiving that which you should. The Bible gives us many examples of God treating people as they don't deserve. The very first one is the very first human beings to walk the face of this earth. They literally ruined God's perfect creation, his masterpiece, with one simple... <laughs> ruined it. If you get a brand new car and your child takes his bike and goes down the length of that car with his metal spike, or if someone you don't know goes down the length of your brand new car and scratches it to kingdom come, what is your reaction going to be? If it's your child, you might be a little bit more reserved. If it's a stranger and no one's around, you're going to yell, curse, and swear. Why? Because you're ticked. Your beautiful vehicle is now ruined. And what did God do? Yeah, he punished him. He said, this is the result of your sin. You're going to die. But he didn't turn his back on him. He said, this is what I'm going to do for you. The Savior will come and take your sins away. You can fast forward to David, that adulterer in murder. What happened? Yeah, he lost his son as a result of his sin. But what did God tell David? You're not going to die. Your sin is forgiven. You can think of the apostle Peter, deny knowing who even this Jesus guy is. And what did Jesus do? He still went to Golgotha and gave up his life, even for Peter. They didn't deserve it. Just like you and I. You can go through the Ten Commandments first to ten, where we don't always make God number one in our lives down to the coveting of our neighbor's dog. We violate them, and what happens? The sin and guilt, it can weigh us down, and what does God do? He still gives you a time of grace here in this world. He still gives you his word. He reminds you of what Jesus did. He says, I'm not going to put down the sins on your own head, and I'm not going to have you suffer the torments of hell. Instead, my son Jesus, he'll take your sins, put them on himself, he'll endure my wrath, he'll bleed, he'll die, he'll suffer. Why? To free you from every one of your sins to release you from the guilt and overwhelming burden that is crushing you because he made payment in full, freeing you and forgiving you. So what? So that you wouldn't suffer as you deserve. 
so that you wouldn't be cast out into the weeping and gnashing of teeth, but so that you would be brought into that joyous kingdom of heaven where they're smiling and feasting. That's the mercy of God. Completely changing your lives through that work of Jesus Christ. And because of that awesome mercy, don't conform to this world. Instead, conform to that word of God. You all have it. You can all read it. Let that word of God guide your steps. Let that word of God be the lamp that lights your path. Conform to him, the one who has shown you so much mercy in Jesus. And you also have this. Starting at verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. <clears throat> if the gift is prophecy, do it in complete agreement with the faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then encourage. If it is contributing, be generous. If it is leadership, be diligent. If it is showing mercy, do it cheerfully. The Lord has given to each and every one of us wonderful gifts in a wide variety of ways. And one of the things he asks us to do in his word is to use our gifts, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of our fellow believer, for the benefit of the world around us. And so whether you're working at Quick Trip, whether you're a, a, a retiree, or whether you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, or whether you're some big CEO-type person, the Lord wants you to use that wonderful gift, whatever it is, for his glory. Doing it cheerfully because of the wonderful blessings he's given to you. That's the will of God. Conform to his word. Live in his mercy. Amen. Oh Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. Strengthen your church and all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. We bring you our request for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your great order, or created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Lord of heaven and earth, we thank you for the 50 years of marriage you have given to Bob and Peggy Brosh. How blessed are they that you have united them together in marriage. How blessed are they that through the sacrifice of your son Jesus, they have been brought into your family. We ask that your blessing continue to be upon them and that you fill their years with joy. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. And now receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and always give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we'll close with the last hymn.
morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for remembering the, the changes to our service times. Just remember there's also Bible class and Sunday school at 9 o'clock as we look at God caring for us still. Uh, those are all the announcements because Pastor Yeager already did his thing. Have a wonderful week. And remember, Monday night services, if you'd like to come to those or know someone who would feel more comfortable coming to those, there's, there's no singing or anything. It's just the Bible readings, the sermon, and, and that's it. So if you could let people know that. Have a most blessed day.